Good morning, everyone. My name is Felina. I'm assistant professor at Delft University of Technology, where I research how children learn to program. And one of the things I've been exploring recently is what happens if you ask people, children, to read source code aloud. And that story I want to share with you in the coming 45 minutes. And it isn't the story that starts with me waking up one sunny morning thinking, you know what would be really interesting if we ask people to read source code aloud. That is generally not how scientific research works, that you get this weird idea. There was a, a whole long story that led to me wondering about this question. So I want to take you on that journey. And one of the things that has been really, really important to me in exploring these type of research questions is the question, what programming actually is? And it seems to be a really easy question. What is programming? Probably you've, you've never even thought about it that way. But if you ask 10 people here what is programming, you might get really, really different answers. Some people say programming, it's just my job, which is fine. Some people say programming is like puzzles, it's like magic, it's like creating something out of nothing. There's lots of different things that people consider programming, but there's also lots of things that people don't consider programming. And the reason I have three fishes here is because maybe us programmers aren't the best people to talk about what programming is, which is best illustrated by this story of three fishes. Maybe you heard it before. So three fishes are swimming, one big one and two tiny fish. And the big fish says, hey, folks, how's the water? And the two tiny fish say, what's water? They don't know what water is because fish are only ever in water. They're never outside of water. So, so they don't have an idea of what water is because to them, water is equal to the world, everything. And this is a little bit like programmers are. We are so much swimming in the water of programming that it's very hard for us programmers to deeply understand what programming is because we can't look at it from a distance. So for you to understand what my perspective is on programming and how I was yanked out of the programming water, we have to go all the way back to 2008 when I moved from Eindhoven. This is the tiny country of the Netherlands. I moved from Eindhoven, which is there, to Delft, which is there, which is like 100 kilometers. But for a person from a tiny country, that's a really, really big move. And I started to do my PhD project in Delft. This is TU Delft, the University of Technology. And the research question that I was supposed to work on that my supervisor had in mind was, let's create a DSL, a domain-specific language for finance. So we envisioned a programming language a little bit like this, where normal people, the non-programmers, could express business rules in a readable programming language so that they didn't need programmers for all of their problems because we, we don't have enough programmers. And it's very empowering for end users to be able to write small scripts. So what I did in the beginning of my PhD projects is I did an internship at a Dutch insurance company. So I just got my master's degree, I came out of university, and I had a sort of naive view of the world. I thought, well, on the one hand side you have programmers, and on the other hand side you have users, and there's a big wall between them. They're really different species of people, and the users use and the programmers program. This is, was my worldview coming out of the university. Those users, the normal people, they need us programmers to be able to do basically anything with a computer. I'm not sure if they still teach this in universities, but when I started, this is definitely what they thought. And I was surprised walking around in that insurance company that was way more like this. Everyone was programming, the programmers were programming, but also the users, the, the accountants, the insurers, they were also programming. But they weren't programming like this, the way we envisioned it in a textual programming language that looks a little bit like a programming language that a professional would use. They were using spreadsheets. All of them, the, the whole company ran on spreadsheets. All sorts of investment models and risk systems were just built by non-programmers in spreadsheets. So I went back to my supervisor and I said, friends, they don't need a domain-specific language in finance. They have a domain-specific language in finance. It's called Excel. 
And this, this became the motto of my PhD dissertation, spreadsheets are code. And I really say this without any, any irony. Spreadsheets are the best programming systems that have ever existed. Spreadsheets are so, such a good programming language that people don't even know they're programming. Like, imagine doing Java by accident. It's like, oh, I just installed Eclipse on my laptop, which was super easy to do on Windows, no problem at all. Then I opened Eclipse, and I immediately understood the syntax of Java, and I got coding. No one ever. Like, we don't expect people to understand a programming language or an IDE like magic, but people understand a spreadsheet. It's such a strong programming environment that is very friendly, but also very powerful. And it is not just spreadsheets are code. Spreadsheets are functional code. Have you, I'm not sure if you ever thought about this, that you're from the functional programming community. A formula in a spreadsheet will never have side effects. A formula can only take input from other cells in a spreadsheet and calculate the results based on those values. So it's a purely functional system. No side effects in spreadsheets. And they're also reactive. If I change a value in a cell, Excel is so smart that it doesn't update everything. It just updates the part of the spreadsheet that is connected to the things that are changed. So it is a functional, reactive programming system, and yet 750 million people can use it. Eat that, Haskell. So spreadsheets are code. This became the motto of my PhD dissertation, and then I wrote a bunch of papers, and I graduated. Hooray! This is the, the story of the brain. Is, did, all of this actually happened, and these are the things I did, and I wrote some papers about spreadsheets being programming systems, and I graduated. However, most stories are not just the stories of events, but they're also the stories of the heart. How was I feeling? while I was writing my dissertation, while I was doing this. And I wasn't feeling super happy, as you might get from this. When I did this talk in another conference, someone said, Feline is doing a therapy session with an audience. It's sort of true. So this is me, super happy. Spreadsheets are coding all around, going to programming conferences like this everywhere, saying, oh, spreadsheets are code. But people were like, it's not real programming. I was like, oh, wait, 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 wait. Saying the same things I just told you, but, but they're functional programming and they're reactive programming. I'm sure this will change their minds. But they were like, nope, not real programming. And this just went on and on and on. And I was just getting sadder and sadder. It's really... Not fun, especially if you do a PhD project, your topic and you sort of become one. So if people say it's not programming, it's, 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 it's really saddening you. And it's, it really drained my energy because I was so convinced I had figured out something pretty interesting that there were programming languages like spreadsheets that people that weren't trained could use to build stuff. Whereas our view, the water of programming that we all share, is very much that programming is hard and you need to learn a very cryptic language and you need to study UML diagrams, otherwise you cannot do programming. So this was interesting and people said, no, nah, it's not real programming. And at this point, I was pretty much convinced that this is the way professionals treat each other. It's like, oh, this is just if you have a job or you, you like something and you go to a community of other people that also like it, they'll just say your stuff is shit. That, that's how people treat each other. What did I know? It was only later, for example, in 2015, that I ran into other communities where, surprise, surprise, people weren't shit. So I also very much like running. Who else is a runner in the audience? So a bunch of people, so you will get this. People that like running like to convince other people that running is very fun. If I see you sprinting to the bus stop, I'll be like, oh, do you like running? Do you want to go on a race together? What's your personal record for the 10K? We are terrible, but, but in a good way. We want to talk about running, but we're always positive and helping each other. My best time on the half marathon is two hours and 10 minutes, which is super slow. I have friends that are almost twice as quick at a half marathon than I am, but they will never say stuff like, you're not a real runner. 
They'll just say, oh, let's go to a race together. They will not say shit like, oh, do you have Adidas shoes? They have security vulnerabilities. This is terrible. The running community is not like that. It doesn't matter what you do. You're just, you buy shoes and you're part of the community and no one is shit. It's like, what? And it's not just running. I'm also a knitter. And I didn't knit for a very long time. I knitted a lot when I was a teenager and then... In my early 30s, I came back to knitting and I went to a knitting meetup with my old fashioned needles. So apparently, things have happened in knitting while I was away. And I used to use these long needles that you've probably visualized when thinking about knitting. But in the meantime, people have moved to using circular needles. So I come to this meetup, everyone has different needles. I have these old fashioned needles that I literally got from my grandmother. So I'm walking in, I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, they're going to say not real knitting. This is going to be terrible. But it wasn't like this. They were super friendly. They were all, I used to have those needles. You know, we got all of them from our grannies. But now things have changed and this is how you use them. People were so friendly. Why can't programming be like this? Why are we so shit to each other? I don't know. I mean, it doesn't have to be like this. We could just say, ah, oh, programming, everyone's welcome, like knitting and running and probably everything else apart from programming. But, you know, let's go back to 2012 because I was really very sad. I wasn't engaged with my research topic anymore, which is really a problem if you're a researcher and you promise the university that you will do more research on this topic, but you don't really feel it. So. I was really stuck, I was like, I should work on spreadsheets, but I don't want to because people will say my work is shit. What do I do? I have to, but I don't want to, and I was like, not very happy. Luckily, and this was really a life-saving situation, I ran into a bunch of children in a local community center in Rotterdam, where I live, and they were looking for a programming teacher. So I was like, okay, well, I haven't done research in a while, um, kind of depressed, but probably I could teach some kids programming because I know programming, so I could teach it to children. I'll, I'm going to be fine. So that was uplifting. And then from then, every Saturday, I went to this club with children and I tried to teach them some programming in using various systems that they already had there. And then something interesting happened because when I was thinking of how to teach these, ch these children, I was thinking of me as a 10-year-old how was I programming when I was a kid? What did I like when I was 10? Because I wanted to you know, create that environment for those kids in which I flourished and in which my love for programming was growing. And notice in this picture, it's just me and a computer. Like many people, I think, of my age, we didn't have programming clubs. We didn't have programming teachers. We had a basic compiler and sometimes a book with basic listings. This is how I learned programming. I had a book with basic listings and I copied them into the computer for hours and then I changed some values and I figured out what it all meant. That was the environment that I was thinking of recreating for kids. And of course, it, this wasn't a very conscious thing. It was just, oh, this is the way I learned. So I just gave those kids some listings, not in basic, but in scratch. I said, oh, you just copy these programs. And, and you'll get it. And this is not just me. I saw some people already in the audience nodding. This is an experience many people in their 30s and 40s share. This is how we learn programming by ourselves, without lessons, without the internet. No one really there to help us. And this, again, is very much a water of programming situation, maybe without you really realizing it, because it doesn't have to be this way. We think of that way of learning programming just because this is what we've been swimming in for a very long time. Imagine your child or a child you care for wanting to learn anything that's not programming. For example, they want to learn to play the guitar or they want to learn to play tennis. What do you do? Do you say, oh, here's a guitar? Do you say, oh, here's a tennis racket? No, no, of course not. You get them lessons. You, you make them a member of a tennis club or a band or an orchestra or you give them private lessons. The first thing on your mind, if you basically want to teach a child anything, you just say, be a member of something. Go, go be part of something and learn like that and get a tutor that will help you to practice. And immediately the things that, that you think of in music, learning a musical instrument or learning a sport is practice. You need lots and lots of boring practice 
and not just, you know, play and jam and all, it'll all be fine. This is very much part, again, of what we believe as a community it, that is true or better. And this is not a coincidence. It isn't necessarily only because in our 30s, the people that are in their 30s learned it like this when they were children. It very much has to do with where programming comes from. Because who knows who created Logo, the first programming language for children? Does anyone know who created Logo? It's a guy called Seymour Papert. He was the creator of Logo, which was the first programming language for children. Maybe people have used it, you have a little turtle and you can draw things in a basic like programming language. He was a mathematician, but he came from a certain philosophy because he studied with one of the most famous psychologists of the previous century called Jean Piaget. And Jean Piaget is the founder of a stream in psychology called constructivism. And the basic idea of constructivism is that constructivism, people don't believe that I can teach you something. It is impossible for me to put knowledge in your brain. The only way people get knowledge in their brain is if they create knowledge themselves. And of course you can help people to create that knowledge, but essentially this is very much, the didactics around this is very much exploring and learning by doing that type of stuff. And Jean Piaget said about Papert, no one understands my work better than Seymour Papert. So even though he was a mathematician and he created a programming language, the, his worldview on teaching was very much hands off and have people just explore. And this comes back in the type of stuff that he made because someone coming from the philosophy of Jean Piaget would say, sure, if you want to give a kid programming lessons, you just give them a programming language and they can construct knowledge of reality by using a programming language. Whereas if you come from more the classic tradition of you should teach people if they need to know something, you can imagine that someone from that philosophy would create not a programming language, but more an interactive tutor that says, oh, do this, now do this. Even 60 years ago when people were working on Logo, it would have been possible to not create a programming language for children, but to create an interactive textual adventure where you would be exposed to syntax in a way that would explain you things. So there is definitely a reason, or there are m many reasons why people in programming generally believe that just giving kids some programming books will, will make everything fine. So that was how I ran my Saturday club as well. I talked about the hard stuff, the concepts, like stuff like a, a loop is repetition, this is the abstract things that are happening in programming, but I didn't talk about stuff like it really, really, really matters where the colon goes. But, but, but it does. But I really, I didn't talk about syntax at all. I, I just assumed, you know, people will see that there needs to be a colon here and an open bracket there. How hard can it be? I, I did it when I was 10. Why aren't these kids having fun? Why aren't they learning anything? It was, it was pretty frustrating. I kept seeing them make similar mistakes in places where I thought, well, but this is clear. So this is part of the why. I understood it was hard, but why is it so hard? And this was before I had explored all of this history and philosophy of programming, so I saw kids struggling, but I didn't deeply understand why they were struggling. This person, Andreas Stepek, is one of the people that helped me understand why syntax is so hard and why it should definitely be something to be taught and not explored. So he did an amazing study. As, as research goes, usually research papers you know, are pretty boring and dry, but this is really, you read this paper and you, you will laugh. It's really very funny and well done. So he had 100 students, and what he did is he gave them little programming exercises in a variety of programming languages, including normal programming languages like Java, Perl, Python, Ruby but also a language quorum that he designed himself to be a very intuitive syntax, but he also used a language called Randomo. And it is what you think it is. It's a programming language with randomly generated keywords. Just, you know, you grab some letters from the ASCII table and that's your keyword. He was just like, let's throw it in the mix to see what happens. 
So Randomo didn't do great, as you can imagine, but it didn't do better than Java and Perl. And Quora and Python and Ruby do better. So I'm going to put that on a slide for you. This is total tweet page. <laughs> Let me summarize the results of Andreas Tapic for you. Novice programmers don't do better in Java or Perl than in a randomly generated programming language. This is how bad we are at designing programming languages. And they're really interesting things because people think like a word like if or a word, a, word, a word like for has meaning because it has meaning to us. But words, those words, keywords, they don't have meaning to us because the word has meaning and by that we learned it. We've just repeatedly been exposed to keywords so that for us it makes sense. But think for a while, for example, about a word like for, for a loop. For is also a number, the number four. And even though you write it differently for young kids or non-native speakers of English, the first thing they see is four, and they're like, oh, maybe you should do this four times. They, they try to attach meaning to a word, even if it's the wrong meaning. So these keywords that we think are intuitive, they're really not intuitive. We just see them a lot, and now we're like, ah, oh, this is what it means. I came to the conclusion, as I said, that really syntax isn't intuitive. We need to teach it. We need to explain kids, this is where a bracket goes, this is where a space goes. But I still had the open question of how? What would be a good way to help kids learn about syntax? Because very quickly, of course, it's, it's going to be really boring. How do you make kids practice in a way that's not super boring and that's going to be effective? So luckily, I go to lots of conferences where I meet many amazing people. So this is another amazing person, Andrea West, uh, sorry, Alexandra West, and she is an amazing person with an art degree. And we were brainstorming at a conference in France, in Paris. It was really nice because, you know, she came from an art background and she was talking to me about, you know, how people create art and how they do reviews in art. It's very different from code reviews where people get together and they discuss art and it's really interesting. So we're like, oh, what, what if we would review code as we do with artworks in a workshop format. That would be so interesting. And I was like, yeah, that's amazing. But we could also create source code as art, and it would be so great. We could have cubic code, and brutalist code, and rococo code, and all oh, this is going to be a new stream in art. It was a very interesting evening in Paris. So this actually led to something other than a hangover. It also led to a workshop I did in, um, in Bergen called Art as Code, Code as Art, where I got a bunch of people together at a conference like this, where I said, okay, let's try to create an algorithm. We did searching algorithms. Let's try to create an algorithm in cubistic form. Well, what does it even mean? What is a, what is a brutalist algorithm? But I thought before we go to paintings and visual artworks, maybe a good idea to start is let's start with poems, because poems are also art, but they're, they're made with words, like programming, so it's going to be a little bit easier to get into making artworks if first we try to do a limerick with code, and only then we try to do ro rococo code. So these are actual slides. Whoops. These are slides from the workshop. So I had lots of fun. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. The people had lots of fun, but I wasn't really surprised and uh, satisfied about where we were getting because we didn't really get really far. And uh, these are the slides I was referring to. So I said to people, okay, we're going to make poems. So for example, for a limerick, you need to count how many syllables are in a sentence to make it sound like um, a limerick. So I had something like, like this. I said, okay, these are the number of syllables, def, bubble, sort, a, list. That's the number of syllables in a line of source code. But it wasn't very easy. Quickly, we started running into interesting edge cases. For example, this. Is this is, or is it becomes, or is it equals? So I said, I ah, know, don't worry about it. You just, for keywords, for symbols, you pick one, it doesn't really matter what you pick, you just make a decision and then you can count the syllables and then you can create a poem. How hard can it be? Well, it was really hard because people started debating the meaning of symbols 
to a very deep extent. So people are like, yeah, sure, no problem, we'll take is. No, no, is is ridiculous because it isn't equality. No, it's assignment. We surely cannot use is. Okay, let's do stores. No. People spent 45 minutes debating how to pronounce a keyword. It was, I mean, it was fun. People were having fun, actually, having those di discussions. But I was like, no, 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 just stop doing this. Tr start making a poem, because we're here to create artworks. I have my big vision of code as art. But it didn't happen, because people spent all their time discussing this. And not just the equal signs, also, for example, an open bracket. Do you say open bracket? Or do you say, if it's a function, F of N. People even said that you should pronounce an open bracket differently depending on context. If you're defining a function, you should say F takes integer, but if you're calling it, you should say F of five. This is where all their energy went, sadly. It was interesting, but it wasn't wh where I wanted to go. But did this, did this lead me to another discussion? So I thought, hmm. Apparently, we have no way to pronounce source code. We don't know how to pronounce keywords and symbols because we, we've never thought about it. We've never agreed how to say things. And apparently, it isn't simply a matter of saying, do whatever you want, because people do have an opinion. So we have an opinion, but we don't have a standard. That doesn't seem to be a great situation to be in. So what I did then is I read the Oxford Handbook of Reading because I thought, I want to understand what people know about reading stuff aloud. There must be research, and there's so many research. I read this, and I was really like, we know nothing. How much do they know? They really know, like, oh, if children are three and a half years of age, they first start to have their first conception of letters, and then they think letters are words, and then they think letters are sounds. They have this whole mapping of how kids are perceiving words, which is amazing, and we have nothing of that. We don't understand how children or even adult learners are perceiving source code. So an interesting thing about learning to read, and maybe you know this if you've ever seen a child that is five or six that are, that's learning to read, is initially people can't read words. They can only read letters. So very young kids will do this, book, book. And it needs lots and lots of practice, like a few months, sometimes even a year, for people to be able to read a word at once. Even if people are, children are able to read a word at once, they don't necessarily immediately comprehend what it is about. So if you have a six or seven year old reading a sentence to you, so they read something like cat in tree, and then you ask them, where is the cat? They don't remember. Because all of their cognitive energy has been spent on reading the words, on not sounding out the letters, but reading the words, and then they don't have other energy left in their no room in their brain to comprehend what is happening. And only if you're older, like seven, eight, nine, if you're a, a normal developing child, you see this word, and this is what happens to us, of course, we are proficient readers, we see the word book, and we immediately think of the concept, and it takes no more energy. It's just because we've practiced. So these stages are stages you have to go to to be able to read words comfortably. And this sounding out is not just something that matters to learners. Even adult professional readers of English, to a certain extent, still sound out words in their brain. And as I said, I'm a scientist, so let's do a tiny scientific experiment. It's also very good to keep you awake to explore the effects of reading source code aloud on your brain. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to show a sentence on the screen, and if you've read through the end of the sentence, you raise your hand. That's pretty easy, right? There, there's one caveat, though. I'm not going to show you the whole sentence at once. You get first the first half of the sentence, and then the second half. And if you've read the second half, then you raise your hand. So let's practice. Perfect. Are you ready for the real thing? One more. So I didn't count, but statistically, it should have taken you a lot more time to read the second sentence than the first sentence. And why is that? Because the word tear can also be the word tear. 
And terror is a little bit less common than tear. So what happened in your brain is you were reading, I have a tear. And then the second part happened, and it's very hard for your brain to continue reading where you have sounded out tear, and then you're like, oh, it's there. You, you, your brain has to go back, sound it out in the right way, and then read it again. And they've done similar experiments with words that change meaning but not sound. For example, calf. Calf can mean part of your leg, but it also can be a tiny cow. So you can have a sentence like, I hurt my calf, and then in the shed or in the gym. And that takes less time than these type of sentences where the meaning changes and also the sound changes. So this sound effect, people sounding out words in their brain, even if you're an adult reader, is still something you do. And of course, this leads to a very interesting question that if words sound ambiguous, comprehension suffers. What about keywords? What about all those times I have been looking at an equal sign and I haven't been able to sound it out properly in my brain because I didn't know if it was going to be is or stores or equals. All the energy you probably spend on not being able to vocalize things in your brain, all that energy is not spent on comprehending the code. And like we know from children that are learning, all energy that is spent on trying to sound out stuff is taken away from comprehension. So it's pretty likely that all the energy that we spend into not knowing how to vocalize keywords is not free anymore to use in code comprehension. So to explore this idea further, we asked 10 novices to read code aloud for us. So something like X is 5, we got a variety of answers. So these are 12-year-olds in a high school where they do get programming lessons, so they were pretty proficient in Python, but they had no clue how to say things. X, X gets 5, set X to 5, assign 5 to X, all sorts of different variations on how to say things. Then we asked 22 professionals in a different setting. These were both Python programmers and programmers but not in Python. They came up with various different things. They even had extra things that the younger kids didn't have. For example, if you have two assignments, some professional programmers would say assign 5 to X and then they would, for the next assignment, they would say reassign 12 to X. So they would even add extra meaning that the novices didn't do, but it, they didn't do it in a more consistent way. Something that was really interesting and that we didn't anticipate is these kids were Dutch kids. This was an experiment done in the Netherlands where I live, and there was this extra effect of not being native speakers of English that was surprising to us. So what was interesting is this letter I, in English you would say I, but in Dutch if you see the letter you say E. So we say it as, uh, English people say it as I as in Thai, but we say it as E as in creep. And these are 12 year olds, so they are, they're proficient readers, but they're definitely not proficient English readers. And this confused them. We had kids that vocalized E differently within a tiny code snippet. So they would say, for I in range, something, something, print E. Within two lines, they would have a different vocalization for the letters. And we observed the teachers as well, and the teachers were very inconsistent in vocalizing the variables in a good way. So this was most likely to be an English version, because it's like idiom, you say for I in range, But then when the teacher were walking around and kids said, teach, what variable do I have to use? These conversations were taking place in Dutch, of course. So the teacher would point at the letter and say, oh, the variable E, the variable E. So this is, there was an even agreement on how to vocalize letters, which of course is interesting. If a child is reading source code like this, have they really comprehended it's the same variable if it doesn't sound the same in their brain? The research we have from the study I showed you on the word vocalizations, there must be some impact. We don't know exactly what. It's, it's pretty hard to put 12-year-olds in a scanner but, uh, on account of the ethical commission of the university, but this would be very interesting, of course, to deeply understand what their brains are doing. The conclusion of this, of course, is we should tell children. We shouldn't leave it up to their own imagination to just decide if a keyword is is or equals. And I don't even necessarily care what version you pick. You just pick one. And as a teacher, be very consistent about this is what the keyword is. 
this is what it means and this is how you say it aloud if you talk about it. We did this in an experiment where we had kids repeat source code aloud with us. So we read it and the kids repeated it, saying like for i in range, open bracket for, close bracket colon, this is how you say it. And the whole class shouted out all the syntax rules with us before they started programming. And from our programming perspectives, I see people in the audience like cringing, like, ah, this is, this is terrible. But I do similar talks for elementary school teachers and high school teachers as well. And they're like, yeah, sure. Why aren't you doing this like forever? I mean, think about how you learned the tables of multiplication. That was just one times three is three, two times three is six, forever. How often did you repeat that? And you didn't think it was silly then. So why would it be silly for programming? This is just the water of programming, people. It, we only think it's silly because we, 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 didn't, we weren't raised with it. But if we compare it to things we do in math and language, it's super normal way to teach kids stuff. And luckily, we found out that it helps as well when we divided the kids into two groups, where these were Dutch kids again, where one group got the vocalization exercises and the other one didn't. The group that got the vocalization exercises did better on questions of syntax. And again, coming from research on language and math, this is zero surprising, but it's very surprising to people from programming because it's just a thing we're not used to. So the conclusion from this talk is we should totally agree on what I call a code phonology. For every programming language, we should just have a simple sheet that says, here are our keywords, this is what the keywords mean, what the words mean in English, because native speakers will not understand what words mean automatically. This is how you say the words. These are the symbols we have in our language. This is what the symbols mean, and this is how you pronounce them if you read them aloud. And teachers should model this behavior. So you should agree with yourself if you're a teacher. This is how we say Python, and every time you say Python, you are very systematic about it. Because otherwise, people will be confused. You, you can imagine a mathematics teacher that teaching the tables of multiplication, sometimes saying, oh, yeah, this is 5 plus 3. Oh, this is 5 and 3. That would totally confuse kids. They pick one pronunciation, and then they stick with it. And this code phonology, so we could have something like this, is not just going to be useful for education. It's definitely going to be useful for education because if you've practiced this, you say something and you know the kids are thinking of the same statement. And you can test this and if kids are still thinking of a different statement, then you understand that they are at a relatively low level and they might need a little bit more help. But it's going to be useful for other situations as well. We imagine that it's also very useful for pair programming. If you're pair programming with someone, specifically someone coming from a different community, like someone is a Java programmer, but you're pair programming Python with them, I would say something like type a bracket. And they would think of a curly, because that's if you're Java or C, that's probably the first thing you think about if someone says bracket. And I'm like, no, no, a round one. These are conversations that are, they, they have happened to me in pair programming with people saying, oh, no, an enter, no, a tab, no, a space, no, a dot. It's super confusing. And if you agree on how to say all the symbols, it's going to be way easier to communicate about source code, especially if you're in a remote pair situation where it's harder to point at things or use a whiteboard to draw what you mean. Another reason that a code phonology is really going to be useful is for people with disabilities. So if you're blind or visually impaired, you typically consume source code using something called a screen reader. And these screen readers, they read text aloud. Pretty simple. But they are not designed for source code. They are designed for natural human language. And that means they have some weird things. So if you have the same snippet of Python, that constructor is going to be read as def underscore underscore init underscore underscore open bracket, closing bracket, colon, enter space space. It's super confusing. It would be way better, especially for young kids that are visually impaired and learning to program, if a screen reader would just say, constructor or initialize method or whatever, something that has a little bit more meaning than underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore. You can think of the cognitive load of how full your brain is if you hear something like underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore. 
It, it takes up all your energy, like, oh, where, where is this going? But it doesn't really matter. And this isn't even the worst part, because if you have something like a field, this is even more terrible, because if you have Harry.name, the screen reader would read Harry, and then a pause, because a dot is a pause, and then name. So it doesn't even read the dot, because normally in natural language, dots should be skipped. And of course, you can set your screen reader to read all the symbols, but then you get everything that you don't want. These things aren't made for source code, and I I've used them because we are engaged in a big project for learning blind kids how to program. And I think it's a miracle that people that that there are people that can actually use this to program. I think everyone that is blind that can program is just immensely smart because it's super hard to consume code like this. And we want to make that available to more people to read source code in a better way. And if we have a phonology, it would be way easier for people that program screen readers as IDE plugins to say, okay, this is just how you say all the keywords. This is a mapping of keywords and symbols to words go wild. That will really matter. So that's all, all the time I have this morning. For the people that came in late or just people that are sleeping because it's so early, let me summarize my entire talk for you in like one or two minutes. So if you missed part of it, then this is your second chance to get the gist of the talk. I talked about how code sounds. How does it feel to your brain if you see source code and you try to pronounce it or have it sound in your brain aloud. And the reason that led me to that line of research is I was exploring the water of programming. Why do we think some things are programming and some things aren't programming? Why do we think some ways of teaching are super normal for the guitar or math, but super weird for programming? It's because our community is very much internal, and we have lots of people that also know programming. These are our friends, these are our social circles, and if people try to break away from that, we get really upset sometimes. So the most important message, I think, from my entire talk, forget about all the reading code aloud, is don't be these people. Don't be not real programming people. We, we should be knitters and runners. And if anyone comes to you and says, hello, I'm a programmer, I do VB6, You'll say, yes, welcome to the programming club. Show me what you've built so far. Don't be mean. We need more programmers, and we need more people to feel happy in our community. So don't be not real programming anyone anymore, ever. Thank you. And that water of programming isn't just impacting how we think about what programming is, it's also very much impacting the way we teach. And people generally in our community aren't really aware that early efforts in programming language design, like Logo, were very much influenced by a certain philosophy of didactics. And it might be room for, uh, there might be room for us to make that broader. One of the things that we are exploring is have people say source code aloud, because if you just ask kids naively, they have no mental model, and the same goes for expert. People don't know how to do it, so we should probably teach them, especially for non-native programmers, which is in Spain, in the Netherlands, in lots of countries, young kids are learning programming syntax maybe before they've learned the words in English. So that's going to be extra confusing for them. And we found out that if you practice this, kids get better at it, unsurprisingly, but maybe surprisingly in our field. So we should totally agree on a code phonology because that's going to be useful for education, but also for people with disabilities and for people that pair program. The end. If you like my talk, I'm on Twitter as well, and I have a website where I cover scientific research, not just my own scientific research, but also other papers that appear in computing education and software engineering. People always ask me, have you drawn those slides by hand? The answer is yes. I've made them with an app called GoodNotes on the iPad with an iPad pencil, in case people are curious. And if people like listening to me, they might also want to check out the podcast that I host called Software Engineering Radio. It's a podcast that appears three times a month where me and a bunch of other hosts interview people from the software engineering community in a one hour long format. So that's something you might want to check out as well. 
Thanks to all the beautiful people that helped me work on this. The end.